My name is Kim and I'm going to talk to you today about evaluating the accessibility of websites with web-based tools, web resources, and plugins. Um, my hope is that you'll walk away today with some great resources that you can take back and use to evaluate your sites. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a freelance accessibility consultant and web developer. Uh, I've been doing this for a little over a year now in the freelance. I've worked with um, education, publishing companies, certification companies, health care, just to name a few. I also have a full-time job where I work in accessibility. I'm a technology accessibility specialist for the University of Alabama and our focus is that we are uh -oh, we have a current we have currently have an accessibility initiative on campus and so I have been tasked and I'm one of three on a campus of 40,000 students to assist the web people with their accessibility needs. So I serve as a resource for questions and if I don't have answers, I look for answers. I also admin our enterprise accessibility tool. So that's quite a busy, uh, busy job. I'm also certified by the International Association of Accessibility Professionals and I've been working with accessibility since 2012. So today, I always like to start my talks off with uh, what is accessibility? Well, according to the W3C, accessibility means websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. More specifically, people with people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. Uh, di disabilities typically um, can include temporary disabilities or glasses. If you wear glasses, that's a disability. Um, if you break an arm, that's a temporary disability. But, not, but the biggest thing is, it's a civil right. One in five people have a disability. So if your website is not accessible and you serve a client base, you could be excluding 20% of your potential users, customers, and students. So I also like to define a little more terms in detail. Accessibility is being ready in a case a need arises. Being proactive, being part of the process of accessibility, and being able to address basic needs when it comes to accessibility. Accommodations, making adjustments once a need is known. Request base, accommodations can typically um, or can sometimes be inherently delayed. So you don't know what your user base may have if they have a disability. So if you um, find out after the fact, you can provide accommodations if possible for that user. Uh, it will always need be needed in some cases and you just have to be reactive. So both are needed. Simple choices can make basic accommodations unnecessary when it comes to reviewing your site. Legal issues. Everyday companies and schools are facing or have faced legal issues. Most recently, Morgan Stanley is being sued for an inaccessible website. A legally blind, uh, a legally blind man out of New York um, is a suing for negligence, saying that their site is not accessible for blind users. This is an ADA uh, violation, human rights violation. Got some notes here. So. So actually, this is the second suit currently right now for Morgan Stanley. They have a previous suit for the same exact reason. Um, Winn-Dixie. Winn-Dixie is a groundbreaking ruling where courts have ruled against Winn-Dixie in a lawsuit. Uh, claims were that people were not able to access their services based on um, an inaccessible website. But Winn-Dixie's claim was that their service was an in-store physical location. So the court ruled against that and awarded, I think, $100,000 to this group. And as you can see, there's several, several popular companies, um, educational institutions are currently under investigation, have faced legal action, or are facing legal action. So where do we start? If you're new to accessibility, you're probably thinking, whoa, how do I fix this? 
The web accessibility standards are the first place to start. Web content, web content accessibility guidelines published by the W3C are gu guidelines from their web accessibility initiative that help um, developers, content specialists, put out information for their pop for the disability for disability accommodations. Um, it was first published in December of 2008, and currently there have a so the current version is WCAG 2.0. It comes in three levels: A, AA, and AAA. And they're under currently reviewing a draft of another version, 2.1, and it's expected to be out as early as summer of 2018. Section 508, this applies to more government funded agencies. Um, they have to make their content and materials accessible. If an agency receives any type of government funding, and this can include nursing homes, healthcare organizations, they receive funding for Medicaid. This affects their ab ability to provide those services if their websites and content are not accessible. It was WIC, or Section 508 was recently refreshed this year to adopt most of the WCAG 2.0 level AA standards, which are kind of the standards you'll see across the board that m more, most people like to achieve. So what are we testing for? We're looking for sufficient color contrast. Can people with visual disabilities see your, see your site? Can they see the text? Is the color, you know, visually, can they see it clearly? Using color is only a method for conveying meaning such as links. So if all your links are, con the color contrast does not work, your, vi your users cannot see those links. All site functionality must be available via keyboard. That's tabbing through your site. Any content that's useful to the user must be accessible while using the keyboard. Text equivalent for images, charts, and graphs. Alternative text. A user with the, using a screen reader will need that information to understand your web page. Real text versus images of text. Ability to enlarge the clearly con it clearly in the content of your site. If you have an image of text and it doesn't have a great resolution and your user needs to zoom in to see your page, they can't see it because it pixelates. Proper heading structures. Headings are not just for decorative styling, they're for structure. Use it for structure first and then come back and add the, de the decorative headings and such later. People use, with disabilities commonly use heading structures to navigate their sites. So this would involve H2s, 3s, 4s, and so on. H1, 2, 3, and 4. Make sure your video contains captions and transcripts. Videos, um, it's really easy to do on YouTube. I wouldn't go with their automated version. I would edit it. Um, those in our, the accessibility field call those craptions <laughs> because they're really bad sometimes. Um, but you ha do have the ability to edit those within YouTube, if that's the platform you use. Skip navigation links. If you have a really busy front page that has all these different areas and you, the person just wants to get to the content, or if you have a big menu and the person doesn't want to tab through everything and just wants to go straight to the content of a page, that's an easy way for a screen reader user to do that. Okay. So to learn about the standards, um, I recommend going to the W3C Web Access Accessibility Initiative tutorials. There you can find information on page structures, menus, images, forms, carousels, everything that you can possibly think of within your web page. They have code-based examples. And it's really helpful. Also, Section 508 has a website. Our, they have their guidelines mapped out on there as well. Theirs are slightly different from WCAG 2.0 level AA, but they're really, really close. Another resource is WebAIM, Web Aim, Web Accessibility in Mind. They put out some great information that's in plain English that's easy for others to understand. 
whereas um, the W3C can be a little bit more technical. WebAIM has great resources, blog posts and such that will really help you. So, how do I test? Well, you can start with some free testing tools. Here's a few that I'm going to talk about quickly today that I recommend. I've used, for the most part, all of them. Um, some of them are, well, most of them are free. They're all are free, actually. But one thing to note when you're using an automated scanning tool is sometimes automated scanning tools report false positives. So you still need to look at the code and give a hands-on approach to that. Maybe a label's missing from a form field, things, but it may have a title field, and the screen reader will read that. It just, it really depends on the case, but that's one thing I want you to keep in mind as you're reviewing if you use any of these tools. So the first one that I've started with is Wave. Web, this is put out by WebAIM. You can do browser extensions, Chrome or Firefox. You can also go to Wave webaim.org and just scan straight into the page. It, they have premium APIs available if that's something you're interested in, but the free tools are really, really useful right now, or if in a quick fix, you know, to just get started. Uh, reports include errors, alerts, color contrast. So I'm sorry if this is really small. I tried my best to get it as big as I could. But this is an example of a wave report. So within a wave report, you have three menu items at the top. You have a styles and no styles and a color contrast tab. So you always have a code area and you always have a left sidebar. And within those areas, you're going to be able to see your errors, your alerts, your color contrast errors, but you're also going to see the good things about your site. So it's going to point out if you used ARIA or HTML5. It's going to point out structural elements, such as things such as that. You can also take it to a no styles view, which will help you determine if your site makes logical sense, your navigation. So if someone were to look straight at your text, they could see this. And another thing I did not say is, you can turn the errors and alerts on and off, and you can view an overlay on your page. So if it gets to be like too many red spots and you want to go in and filter those out and just address the yellow areas, you can turn those off. And the color contrast area. It includes um, tools so that you can change lighter, darker, play around with your color contrast, and it also tells you if it passes or fails WCAG level AA and A and AAA, I believe. So it's a really helpful tool to get started with, and it, it just makes really clear sense. They also offer information as well. So they have an info area that you can click a link, and it will take you to the WCAG website that tells you in detail why this is an error why is important. Another free option is Achecker, achecker.ca. This is a, a website that will allow you to up, uh, enter a single URL, do an HTML file, up, file upload, uh, post in your HTML markup, and it also has an HTML and CSS validator. You can I also go in and put the levels to check against. So if you have section 508 only, you can click that. And the output will be exactly what you specified. It gives you the line that it occurs in in the code. It also gives you a link to resources about it. Uh, the success criteria guideline, it tells you what it falls under. You can see known problems likely problems, potential problems, and you can export those out in the form of PDF, CSV files. That may be helpful if you're creating reports. Another resource is the Axe Accessibility Engine by DQ. DQ is, an, um, is a company that specializes in accessibility, and they also have an enterprise, very expensive uh, service that you can buy. 
but they provide some free browser extensions. These are open source and they work through your developer tools within your browser. They, they also have a beta version called Axe Coconut. So if you're into trying out new things, you can download that as well. Let's see. So I'm sorry it's so small, but that's an example of an Axe report that you get. So it, um, it reviews the violations, the possible violations. You can select to highlight the areas in which your violations occur, and you can actually learn more about those through a link that's provided for you. And again, when I say automated scans can give you false positives, this allows you to dismiss a false positive that may occur. So you can do that as well. Um, you can inspect nodes of your page. So if you just have a general menu area you want to check out, you can inspect that area of the code. And you can also review the impact of the violation and learn more about the impact. So if it affects screen reader users or if it affects someone with a visual disability. Accessibility developer tools is a browser extension by Google and it runs through their developer tools and it just allows you to go in and view the markup and the code of your site and see potential problems that may occur. So, so again it's going to be another little tab within within your um, within your developer tools. Very similar to Axe in a way. Funkify Disability Simulator is a browser extension, and yes, I did say Funkify, but it's a really cool simulator that you can add to Chrome. It allows you to pick a situation. So if you see Blurry Bianca, Dyslexia Danny, Trembling Trevor, you can pick a type of disability and test it through your site. So here's an example, I picked Color Carl. Man manipulates colors with different filters so that you can distinguish color contrast issues that may occur. You can adjust the severity of it. Can you see it? It's hard to see it, I know. Um, you can just choose what type of you know, just play around with their disabilities and kind of see what someone views. There's one on here that will in, um, simulate trembling hands if you're a mouse user. So if you're an older user that may have arthritis or some trembling, how they would actively use it. Go on there and try it sometime. You'll really get a feel for what, you know, people out there go through. Let's see. And then this is an example of Blurry Bianca. So. Let me say that I did not pick any specific site, I just grabbed some sites, so I'm not targeting anybody. But this, this applied a filter to this site. So if someone who doesn't have very clear vision may be suffering from cataracts or may need glasses or contacts and can't see very clearly, that's an example of what they see on the site. Another tool is the Color Contrast Analyzer. It's a free tool by the Paciello Group. They're accessibility people as well. Um, you can determine pass-fail assessments for WCAG color contrast. It will also do simula simulations for you, very similar to Funkify. It's only for Windows and Mac. And it's a great tool because, let's flip over. You have a color picker, so if you're working on a site, that particular window that you see will overlay on top of your site. And if you need to pinpoint a very specific color, you can do that. Background, foreground, or if you have the hex code, you can enter that as well. It's going to tell you if it passes the WCAG levels, it's going to tell you the contrast ratio, which is important when it com comes to color contrast as well. This is, this is, I use this daily, uh, daily in my job, so I love this one because of the ability to just put it with any site at the time you're working with. Accessibility bookmarklets. This is a resource that comes out of the University of Illinois. 
It's by their Disability Resources and Education Services. So they're great resources. This, this group puts out classes that you can take, a badging program, excellent, excellent resources there. But basically, you drop this bookmarklet into your browser, and I just clipped a little image, but you can detect your headings, your list, your images, your forms, your landmarks. Let's show. So it's really hard to see, but if you notice, I have selected the images, and I have selected, I think it's the heading structure, which is really, but it will label that particular image. So it, it allows you to quickly check if text is an image or if it's text. This is very helpful when you're reviewing sites. But they just click on and off. You click the buttons. Very easy to install. Any questions on any of those so far? Three slides on line mm -hmm. Could you back up for just one Sure. That one you show actually on the web page as an overlay where things are. Mm -hmm. uh, on the previous ones where it gives you the report and it shows you where the code is from, can you link directly into the code from that from that snippet? Um, can you make the correction in that snippet or do you have to actually go to the code? You have to actually go to the code. Unless you're using, I think, the developer tools you can match up. Um, I have not done that in the evaluations. But... Um, with WebAIM, you will actually have to go in and change it as well with the Wave tool. So you'll have to go to your code. But it tells you where to find it, exactly where to, to go within that page. In, the last one, in this one here, if you hit images, I notice it pops up with the ING. Mm -hmm. Does it give you um, the uh, uh, alt code uh, material there? It will. And you can right click and inspect okay. your image, and it will give you specifically what it says within the code. Yep. Any other questions? Did everyone get these? Does it, do I need to go back for any URLs? And these should be online as well. Mm -hmm. um, there was a list where you listed things like color contrast, colors only. Mm -hmm. On the bottom it said something about skip nav links. Mm -hmm. You tried to explain it, but you said a couple of things I just didn't. Okay. So if you have a, say, a mega menu on your page, and it would force a user that was using keyboard navigation only to tab through that mega menu before actually accessing content. The skip nav will present itself before it goes into your menu and you're able to go straight to your content. Okay. That, does that make sense? Yeah. Is that something that's like hidden? Um, and just be for people that are using the site? No, you can use it. Um, you can, I've seen some hidden. I think it's a general best practice. Uh, we I don't recommend hiding them because it is a good feature for everyone. You know, if if you're I keyboard navigate a lot now just because I'm doing it all the time, and I find it I just find it quicker sometimes to just tab to a skip nav and go to the content. Yeah. And a lot of times, if you're tabbing from the title bar, that skip nav will immediately, if it's not displayed on the page, it will immediately display. If it's not hidden in a screen reader only tag, it will display for you. So you'll see skip navigation or skip to main content. So is that something that you like have at the top left of your page? Or mm -hmm. right the right mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. So let's talk a minute about some WordPress plugins. Um, these are, these are just a few of what's out there and a few that I've actually used. WP Accessibility, Wally, Totally, and Access Monitor. So WP Accessibility helps with common accessibility problems. It, um, it allows people that don't have the expert knowledge to go in and make some adjustments to their site quickly and easily. Uh, WP Accessibility will add skip links, add language and directional attributes to your HTML. It will outline, give you an outline for keyboard focus, um, give you a toolbar to monitor your high contrast, low contrast, add long descriptions to your images if that's something you need for your alt text, and enforce alt attributes on your images. So 
You will be able to mark an image as a decorative image if it's just a fancy picture you decide you want on your page and it conveys no content. Or you can go in and specify what it's for. Wally, the Web Accessibility, Accessibility Toolbox, it provides um, kind of a combination of several different tools I've talked about today. And I actually have to give a plug out for my friend Rachel Cherry. She did write this, formerly Rachel Carden. She's a sy systems engineer at Disney now, but she worked with me at the University of Alabama. So she's pretty awesome. She heads up the WP campus, if you've heard of that. So she does those camps. Okay, let's see. So again, the Wally tool will kind of basically put wave within your CMS and totally, which is a visual simulator to evaluate color contrast, right in the CMS so that you can work with it. The operations are very similar to if you were using it outside of the CMS. You mentioned that A11Y is an abbreviation. Yes. Yes, it's like the first letter of accessibility and the last letter of accessibility and the total letters, 11. Accessibility, that's what. WP Totally, this is by Khan Academy, and it helps you visualize how your site performs with assistive technology. Um, and if you want to get that GitHub address, it's pretty helpful. You can use Totally outside of a WordPress plugin, which is available at that URL. And I'm going to flip over to the next one. So it puts an overlay, and this is just even on your back end, and it tells you what items are labeled H1s, 2s, 3s, um, allows you to kind of go through your site it, with two overlays to detect potential accessibility issues. Tenant I.O., um, and I, I skipped over Access Monitor, but Access Monitor is another plugin in which Tenant I.O. will run through as well. Tenant I.O. has a free copy-paste URL scan but they have a premium service, so they give you some great information as well. Um, so if you wanted to check out that. These are some services with just free trials. Sort Site is a suite of website testing tools. If you can be found on powermapper.com. It has an on-demand cloud-based version that has, I think it's a 30-day free trial if you want to check it out. But it gives you reports based on your success criteria and, and level priority, what's important, and gives you the code, where to find it, as such. And they also have a desktop tools for purchase, but it's pretty extensive. I do know that the OCR, Office of Civil Rights, uses WAVE and Power Mapper to evaluate sites for accessibility. So if you were to receive an OCR complaint letter, then those would be the tools they use. So how can you help? I'm going to give you 10 things that you can start doing today, okay? So you can foster an awareness of accessibility. You can learn more about accessibility, and today you are. You're sitting in any accessibility talks that were presented. An important thing for your websites is to keep lines of communication open with your users. Contact information is easily available. You have an email or a phone or accessible web forms. Those are really important. Communicate clearly and concisely within your site. Um, people with learning disabilities who can't understand complex sentences or people with cognitive disabilities, if your sentences are long and lengthy and complex, they can't quite comprehend that or even with lower literacy or language skills. Content that is easy to understand by users that aren't familiar with a certain topic. Um, there, there's three or four that don't of WCAG, if you compare WCAG and 508. And I can show you. I can show you a checklist if you'd like to look at it a little bit later. But um, it will. That are very similar, but yet the three or four don't have a WCAG 
or Section 508 association. So it's, they're, they're similar but different, I guess if that makes sense. But I can definitely show you a checklist I've compiled that compares the two and it will allow you to figure out which ones apply to which. Have there been cases where someone's been sued because their website was not accessible to someone with cognitive uh, deficiencies? Because that seems to me pretty impossible. Yes, yes. It's, it's hard. And you know, um, one thing is your website can't be 100% accessible. And as hard as you try to make it, you cannot determine what your user, you know, what disability they may have. All you can do is be proactive about it and be like have your communication open for users. But specifically, most of the suits I've seen are for people that have mobility issues and vision impairments. What was the purpose? Mobility issues. So if, if someone is um, a quadriplegic or or can't or uses keyboard navigation only to get through their site, they can't. They they. They, there's a lot of those. Are, okay. Convey your content in multiple ways. Don't just use images, colors, video, and audio. So this is, is an example of a bus route that's using color only to convey the information. And this is an example of someone who might have diachromacy that may be looking at that bus route. And you really can't determine because they all kind of go together. So, tell your vendors, your publishers, your third-party companies that you work with that accessibility is important to you and ask them how they're planning for it. Start with questions, ask for VPATs, which are voluntary product accessibility templates. Here's a few questions that you could ask them. Can users perform all functions with a mouse? Has the tool or product or site been tested using assistive, te assistive technologies? If so, what did they use? What methods did they use? What were their findings? And who did the testing? Is there someone that is a screen reader expert? You know, or is it a company maybe that tested for you? That's important. More questions. If your product supports audio, does it have captions? If your product supports output, does it have an accessible output? And this would include like PDFs, and that's a whole other realm of <laughs> accessibility. So, hmm? On the first one, do you mean if you have, can you say more about that first one? If, you're pro if your product, if the product supports audio, does it have captions? Right. Uh, so if you have video and audio, do you have a transcript for your audio? Do you have captions on your video? Uh, captions on your video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, you can ask them if they have accessibility documentation available, like the VPAT. And if they do, you can even just ask them up front, do they have accessibility related issues? So again, you can request the VPAT, request WCAG accessibility statements. And a lot of times, if you, if you have a vendor that's depending on you, you know, you can consider contract changes. I know in higher ed, we have huge contracts and, you know, we're required by law to provide those in accessible formats. And if these vendors don't provide that, then we could consider, you know, taking a, a multi, you know, million dollar contract out of their hands. Just really depends. Explore help materials, such as the, WIC, uh, the W3C website or WebAIM, um, and consider alternatives to your, your vendor. Again, ask for caption or transcribed versions of any media you use. That's very important. Avoid click here, read mores, and other generic link menu text. So what that means, if a screen reader user is using your site, your link should be very clear to what you're linking to. If it just says click here, link, is the way a screen reader would read it, link click here, you don't really know where it's going to. And many times, screen reader users use links to navigate. They just want to go through and check out all the links on the site. Hmm? Would you give an example of what a great link would be? Um, if you have a registration page, and you say, 
registration form is available or something such as that. When say to register, click here, you would say, you know, you, maybe your registration or your register or something such as that would be your link text. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I use the term uh, read more or click for more mm -hmm. uh, in short snippets to get to a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest then using the alt to say read more about and then whatever the subject is? So that would be so helpful. It, instead yeah. of hitting read more, read more, read more, mm -hmm. one would be read more about registration, read mm -hmm. more about, mm -hmm. you know, Yes, history. yeah, or more about, regi or more, more regi about yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you do you find I feel I feel the compelled to always use like an action word to like yes. let them know that it's something to click on. Definitely. So I guess it's just about being more creative with that. Right. Okay. And it's it's all going to be based on your content and what you're like what a, you're writing. How do you feel about like buttons or or underlines on those types of links? The click here type. Um. Okay. I guess I feel like if I put a button there and I say about us or who we are, or something like that, how do they know to click that to well, go to more? If, you're, if, if it's a menu item, yeah. you know, if it's about, that's kind of different. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like within mm -hmm. what you were talking about, within a snippet. Well, when you, you would use that as the alternate text. Text. Mm -hmm. Yes. From what I understand, you can use the read more mm -hmm. for the visually you know, acceptable people. Yeah. But if you need if you need more information for somebody like me, if I don't have my glasses on, it would say read more about okay. click here, mm -hmm. read more about. Mm -hmm. so, it does it doesn't read the screen, it reads the code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, if you have multiple read more like you're talking about on yeah. one page, yeah. you'll get it by the way there are four not Yes. Links, you will. Yeah. You will. That's yes. Mm-hmm. Um, question? This might be a question for all the WordPress super users in the room, but when you are simply doing a news story and I have to post news stories, I tell them to use the more tag to indicate this is the break and in our news feed is when to say read more. Mm -hmm. Is there some way we can dynamically change that text? Yes. Yes. That would be accessibility tool. You can, there's a checkbox and it will make all the read more and continue readings. Um, it repeats the title of the article. Yeah. It does. Customize it if you don't want to read. Customize that text. That doesn't read anything. Yeah. You can customize the text and read anything. Is that kind of <coughs> but that's anything we want. That, that's not dynamic to change. Is it? Sounds like the accessibility makes it dynamic. Yes. Um, another thing is to build accessibility into your work pra practices for any content. Um, so if you have a PDF that you put on your site or a Word doc, there are accessibility checkers and features built in to Word documents, all the Microsoft Office products, and PC and Mac versions as well. So I recommend kind of checking that if, you, if that's the type of content you use. I also recommend checking out the assistive technology on your computer and or mobile devices. Then think about how someone would use it. So to find those assistive technologies, VoiceOver within your Mac is available in your system preferences under accessibility. And your ease of access center, if you're a Windows user, you can find your narrator. Have you actually, I've never been able to use a narrator with any success. Um, yeah, it's it's reader. not one of my favorites, but it's built in. I use a different screen reader that's yeah, freely. Use a third -party screen mm -hmm. what do you use? I use NVDA, and it's available um, for Windows platforms only. It's free. Mm -hmm. It's great. 
Um, N V, the letter V, D is in dog, A. It's an apple. And again, I encourage you to learn more about accessibility, and WebAIM is a great place to start with that. So, any more questions? Yes. What's your opinion on using an A to Z index as an accessibility tool? Well, how do you mean a tool specifically? <laughs> well, if, if someone using a screen reader comes down the page and their screen reader says A to Z index and they click it and simply you list it every single page on your site, is that going to be compliant? Or well, you could use heading structure within that. So if you have um, someone that's navigating the page using the headings, maybe an A, the ABZ, and then they could go in and look at the individual links. That would be helpful. Yeah. Just gives them an order to follow by, not just a bunch of links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar um, to that. It sounds kind of like an alphabetically ordered site map. Yes. Which mm -hmm. in 1997, when I started doing web, um, every, every website had a site map. Mm -hmm. And also, since bandwidth was an issue, a lot of you know, the big sites would have a text-only version, mm -hmm. which I don't see anymore. And I think because bandwidth is no longer an issue, there's no concern about that. But do you see where a text-only version comes into place for like your website at the university? or Where we've kind of trans transferred over to more like responsive design. So we've removed that text-only option with, um, and we're just constantly working toward accessibility. And so you don't, you really don't see it as often. And that's because the screen readers and things such as that are just getting more, more dynamic and allowing you to, to navigate through your pages a lot more efficiently than um, a straight up text page. So and then you make a recommendation for your uh, end users on which screen reader or what adaptive technology they should adopt to use your website or no. you just present it? We just, we just work to make it as accessible as we can and if there are problems we have open lines of communication so that people can contact us so if, you know, if they can't access a certain document and such. Yeah. So we have, we have our own forms and contact information, everything's out there. Is there any kind of best practice in reference to redundant links? Like the gentleman behind me mentioned a blog feed, which yes. for WordPress users is wildly relevant. And lots of times you'll see people post the title of an article as a link, and then at the end of an excerpt is a read more link to mm -hmm. the same thing, both holding different text describing what they are. Yes. Um, you see, where that hasn't necessarily become an error in redundant links, you do see that as an alert. And a page full of those can be an issue. So I think limiting those, if possible, or breaking them up some sort of way, that would be what I would recommend. But there, are, people have different best practices as far as that type of thing. So, but I can definitely, if you want to contact me, I can look up and see if I can find more information out for you. Any other questions? Yes. Is there um, a browser that's better for? Uh, users um, that they is there one more that's commonly used by people who need accessibility functions? Um, so on a Mac, you tip. When you're testing, we I use very specific browsers, okay. but I wouldn't say that. There actually WebAIM does a screen reader survey, and you can go in and look at the results, and it will tell you. And I can't remember just off the top of my head, it will tell you what most assistive technology people or you know users are actually using what screen readers are using what's the most popular what browser do you use um, on windows i use firefox with nvda okay. and on mac i use safari with voiceover because it's the native the native do you test everything on both devices when you're do you like we test responsiveness or whatever on different devices you do the same thing yes yeah. But definitely, when um, on if you're strictly limited to one, 
Windows, I would go with Firefox and NVDA. NV Firefox presents the HTML a little better to NVDA. One thing about, so JAWS is a screen reader that's commonly used for, with, for people, or with people. Um, the problem is JAWS is it tries to put a Band-Aid on issues, which is great for the user, but if you're testing to try to determine if there is an issue, you want to know, you know, how to fix that. And you may have a Mac user that is using VoiceOver and it doesn't fix that issue for them. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah. What is like probably the most frustrating thing when you go to a website that's not accessible? The menu. The menu. Mm -hmm. Not being able to keyboard navigate through. And that's like hitting tab. That's hitting tab. Shift tab will take you back. Pressing enter, space bar. Things such as that. A lot of the themes that are popular right now, you can tap through the menu and you have drop downs, but it doesn't trigger the drop down to see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you should always test. test yes. Test. That, is a, that is a really big issue I've seen a lot of is your drop downs. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about mega menus, we're talking about simple you know, lists within your menu. Okay. Um, on training for um, as a compliance technician, where do you suggest? Um, definitely start with the W3C. I think their tutorials and their resources are great, and WebAIM. WebAIM is one I would recommend. For the self-learning, do you mm -hmm. recommend any? Um, there, well, you can go to trainings. Mm -hmm. So WebAIM actually. They provide training and they do a wonderful training. I've actually been through the WebAIM training. Um, I've actually been through several different types of training. The University of Illinois, I've done their badging program as well. And it's, they're great resources. Is a, is a site map a page actually a benefit or not? Accessibility? I don't, I don't think it is or it isn't, you know. I don't, your, your users just, it's going to go with what's presented to them. And if you have someone using a screen reader, typically your sitemap's in your footer. So they're not going to get to your sitemap unless they tab through everything or they use the screen reader to go to the links only. And typically that could be the last content they access. Okay. And if you have any other questions, I'll be around today and tomorrow. So. Hi. Thank you. You said the, the slide deck is available through, um, it's just on the... Um, I think they're going to post it on the site, I believe. Yeah. And if you don't, if, um, if, if they don't, send me an email and I can send it to you.